You may recognize that as the Super Mario Brothers theme song. And it was played through my phone because I forgot the CD. Because I'm an idiot. We are joined today in studio by Mary McKenzie, the partner, and she also runs Volcano Bean Gaming. And we also have Carol Mertz from Happy Badger Studios. She's also the president of the St. Louis Game Developers Co-op. Thank you both very much for coming in and talking with us. Thanks for having us. No problem. So a podcast about gaming was something I thought would be a good idea because I know nothing about gaming. (laughs) And I don't want to be the person who just talks about things that I think I know relatively well. Mm -hmm. So... I figured we'd just have a little chat uh, so I could get more versed on the subject. So, uh, Carol, let's start with you. Uh, What is it you do for Happy Badger, and what all is involved in being the president of the St. Louis Gaming Co-op? Cool. Well, at Happy Badger Studio, I'm one of the partners, and so that means I do a lot of things because there's only about five of us on the team. Um, So I, specifically on the game that we're working on right now, which is Smugglecraft, which is a quest-based hovercraft racing game for the PlayStation 4 and uh, PC, Mac, Linux on Steam. Um, Coming 2017. (laughs) (laughs) Get the plug in, Um, that's fine. Yeah, so I do do narrative design, I do character design, I do PR. Um, It's, I I mean, we we do a lot of um, promotion and in-game, or in-house playtesting and game QA, which is quality assurance for anybody uh, familiar with the software development world. Um, really, it's just, I mean, when you have so few people on your team, you do so much. Um, and then for the St. Louis Game Developer Co-op, um, that's actually a local nonprofit that's uh, community driven. It's um, a group of us uh, game developers are putting together uh, support resources and event Pardon me, event opportunities. I just get so choked up <laughs> about this. It's so important to me. It's a, um, it's it's a, essentially opportunities and resources for game developers in the city. And so, as the president, I organize a lot of the events. I do a lot of the community management, and I just make sure that everybody has what they need to be making the best games possible. What type of events uh, are they? What what venues are they at? What goes on at the events? Oh gosh, lots. So we have we have a pretty huge diversity of event types. We do anywhere from Networking, like general networking party events, we have the game dev drink up every month where game devs just get together to have a beer and talk shop. And then there's also educational events, which are, um, that could be a seminar, it could be a panel. Um, Those are frequently held throughout the city at different venues like the Science Center, like the local office of Riot Games. Um, Often at universities like Webster University, we just uh, recently had one there. Um, and then we also have what's called game jams, which are um, typically two days. They're like hackathons, if you're familiar with software development. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically 48 hours. A whole bunch of geeks get together in the same room, form teams, get a theme, and then build a game within 48 hours. Okay. And it is one of the most amazing, informative, and important experiences an independent game developer can have. Uh, because you realize that you can start and finish something really quickly. And it's uh, it's a huge lesson in prototyping and just productivity. Um, so those are those are the three core kinds of events between the networking, the educational, and then the game jams. Um, but I mean, I'm sure there's there's other stuff that I'm forgetting. But it's 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 a really important and really awesome way for game developers to just kind of keep keep building their network and keep honing their craft and really keep pushing themselves to be the best they can be. That sounds really cool, especially the drinking one, because you know who doesn't <laughs> like to drink. <laughs> And Mary, uh, what's about uh, Volcano Bean? Tell me a little. Um, we are a small company as well. We're only three people. So again, so similar to Carol, like you do a lot of different things. Um, I I tend to do a lot of the producing um, business side of everything, making sure we're actually a company. Um, but also I do prototyping. I do coding, um, a little bit of the art, um, animation, a little bit of everything, honestly. Um, we have two small games out right now that are on mobile, um, iOS and Google Play. They're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And there's Where's My Goblin? It's a mixing, matching game with goblin parts. And Sleepy Kraken, which is a tap and smash arcade style um, game. Nice. Yeah. How long do those take uh, to, because I know she, Carol was just saying 48 hours sometimes. How long do <laughs> do games like that take to develop? Obviously um, not 48 hours. <laughs> no, but honestly, um, part of us getting into gaming, um, we just wanted to see if we liked it. So mm-hmm. our first game, Where's My Goblin, we set a three-month timeline. And I was like, I want to make a game from start to finish. So I want to make something small enough that we can finish in three months it actually took us five which is fairly normal everything's going to take you a little bit longer so i'm a fan of aggressive deadlines and keeping your scope small 
Um, so yeah, that one took us about five months, and then Sleepy Kraken took us similar five, five and a half, because we released on iOS about a month before we released on Google Play. So okay. that one's a little bit more spread out. Do you have another one you're working on currently? Yes, we do have um, our third game, Battle Cakes, um, which is a <laughs> snack-sized RPG, <laughs> which will hopefully be out late spring next year, and we're hoping to push that one to console. Nice. Yeah. So uh, the question for both of you, um, is there a huge, obviously there are some differences, but what would be the biggest difference between creating a game for a mobile device like a smartphone or an iPad versus doing a console game? There's there's a lot more overhead with doing a larger, and I say larger because it's typically larger, but doesn't have to be, but doing a game for a console or for a PC, um, those are generally the polish level is expected to be higher. Not not to say that mobile doesn't have polished games because hell yeah it does. Yes, there's um, really beautiful stuff. But yeah, the barrier the en- bar- entry barrier to entry is um, <laughs> a lot lower. I think on mobile, it's a little less scary to jump into. The publishing process is also simpler. Yes, much simpler. Um, so that's one of the core differences um, between between console and mobile is that. For console development, you have to go through something like Microsoft or Sony and have this, you know, extended relationship where, you know, you get the development kit and you, you know, are they're they're typically locked down, so you have to be communicating with people at that corporation about, you know, making sure that you have everything you need to test your game and to to make sure that it's, you know, it works. Uh, whereas on mobile, most of us have the mobile devices that we need to test on, and they make that testing. Uh, that testing process a lot simpler and then the publishing process is like a day <laughs> as yeah. opposed to several weeks. Apple is a little bit longer because you do they do have a much more rigorous um, screening process so mm-hmm. that one usually takes around a week but even then that's a week yeah. for them to look at it and they don't QA your game like they make sure that nothing is inherently broken or there's no viruses or malware on it but other than that they really like where if you go to Sony or Microsoft like they put your game through a rigorous QA process before mm-hmm. it can be released because again it's it's a different standard it's a different medium almost yeah, absolutely so a lot of people who go to school for a certain trade or something end up not doing anything all related to what they went to school for is that the case with both of you um it's actually the case for me i was a fine arts major i was a textile and photography major i went into costume design after college um but also spent a lot of time in retail management so yeah i kind of came to games in a very wibbly wobbly Kind of timey path. wimey yes very <laughs> timey wimey kind of path um which i really think actually i feel like gave us a really big jump start because all three of us at volcano bean had like grown-up careers or have grown-up careers um as well so i feel like it a lot of those real life lessons we were able to pull and use to our advantage when we started making games and kind of jump over a lot of um hurdles that a lot of people struggle with when they first make games mm-hmm. and uh on the flip side i Technically, you went to college for a relevant career or a relevant major in that I went to Webster University for um, interactive digital media with mm. emphasis in animation, oh, fun. which was way more along the lines of web development and general media development. And I didn't really learn anything about games at the time, but it was all very relevant for when I started making games. So that was really nice. Um I don't actually animate that frequently <laughs> anymore, <laughs> but having that experience, especially as a studio owner, is really important to have that kind of broad gamut of um, media experience. I took video classes. I took, you know, I took a lot of um, special effects and just general promotion and things like that. And it was it was really cool to to have that kind of background um, because I think it gave us at our studio a little bit of a step ahead in that we knew, you know, how to cut a trailer, for example, or, you know, how to build a good website. Um, and that's that's really important, especially for an independent developer, because, you you know, you don't have a huge crew of people promoting your game for you. That's you're you're not just making your game, you're promoting it, too. Yeah, I think that's a step that like actually making the game is often the easy part. It's the promoting your <laughs> yeah. game and like yeah. making people aware of your company, like is really the hard part. And at least if you want to make money. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and you really like almost spend as much if not more time doing that stuff or you should if you want to be like a financially viable company if you just want to make games like absolutely you can totally do that fairly Mm -hmm. easily but if you there's kind of that that difference like if you really want to become a real company like you're going to spend a lot of time marketing and that's something a lot of people kind of want to ignore because Mm -hmm. they don't want to do it it's not my favorite thing it's not the the fun glamorous job absolutely it's not the fun part like the fun part is solving problems and like figuring it out and like making the mechanics and the art and you don't really want to think about like having to send out like the 
millions of PR emails. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think a lot of people, especially indie developers, feel like it it conflicts with the core values of what it means to be indie mm-hmm. is like self-promotion. But it's it's so important if you want to be indie and gainfully indie. <laughs> 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 you know, like you have to be able to promote your game. You have to be able to talk about your game. You have to, ha- you know, be able to say in one sentence what your game is and why people should buy it. And then you also have to learn how to contact press and how to, you know, just effectively promote yourself because otherwise nobody's going to know who you are and nobody's going to play your game, even if it's the best game in the world. Like no one's going to find out about it unless you just like buy, you know, buy some grace of deity (laughs) some you know editors yeah you out of the what is it 3500 games a week get published wow really i could be totally off on that number so forgive me okay it's something (laughs) massive like like massive and you know even a few years ago it was only like 500 really so again that's a huge growth there really really is and so there's just a lot of um a lot of games out there and so it's like playing the lottery yeah it really is because there's that one in a million example of a game that like they do zero promotion and they just become Hmm. amazing and like flappy bird or something yes uh, flappy bird is a perfect example it's a really simple game like really like pixel graphics um and it just exploded and yeah. people like are like i want to do that and that was just such a it was like, a lightning strike like, it exploded several months after it came out even because yeah. a youtuber picked it up and this is this has become a huge thing for game developers again especially indies and we're speaking from the indie standpoint because we have the most experience there we don't really have any experience working in AAA or you know we don't have a lot of connections within AAA so we can only speak from our own you know perspectives but as an indie having a popular youtuber Um, or like a content creator, a streamer on Twitch or something, pick up your game and play it is massive in most cases because that is going to get way more eyes on it than you could by yourself. So I think as social media expands, I would think the marketing tends to get a little easier maybe with uh, all the, you know, if you have all the Snapchat and YouTube and you're good at doing social media, I would see that help. Good at is the key key phrase there because I think a lot of people are not like, it's definitely not my comfort zone. Like I love social media for like personally, but business wise, it's it's kind of hard to find that o- your authentic voice mm-hmm. in that matter and not feel like you're just trying to be like a well, carnival barker. Like, <laughs> I think you have to kind of, you said you're comfortable with it personally, but yeah. not business wise. Turn your business into like tweet yes. from your business the way you would tweet from your personal. And yes, that way absolutely. it's, it's easier and it's more personal. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think being a small company, it is like yeah. your company is you like, or three for us, it's three of us so yeah it is very much still like i think the difference between like triple a and indie is that an indie studio really is the like sum of the parts like mm-hmm. where triple a is a giant corporation mm-hmm. you know, hundreds sometimes hundreds and hundreds of employees big yeah and there's like a team of people specifically to yeah. schedule and monitor twitter and facebook yes. and all of these things and it's um for us we have to find the time throughout the day while we're developing a game and contacting press and yeah. you know making sure that we're scheduling our convention times and you know building our booths and stuff you know we have to figure out how to actually make the time for social media and community building yeah you wear a lot of different hats and it's kind of at least that's something i struggle with is switching gears mm-hmm. when you're in the middle of something so like when you're in coding headspace it's a very different headspace than oh yeah sending out a marketing email or a pr email or setting up booth space or figuring out where you're going to be for the rest of the year to promote mm-hmm. your game in person. And it's you have to kind of figure that out as how you move through those as seamlessly as possible. So I would think a couple of things just from what you both said that make the indie gaming scene a little more attractive is A, you don't have a lot of parameters set upon you by a larger corporation, which would be good. Yeah. And I would think too that with everyone that has a smartphone, everyone's carrying around their iPad, games that would go right to those devices would be easier to promote am i wrong not necessarily i mean in in some cases you know being able to say you can download this now is great but you can download something now on any device now i mean like there's digital downloads for all of the main consoles hmm. there's digital downloads for pc um and then there's obviously the the app store from your phone um it, it's kind of amazing how accessible indie games have become in the past you know five ten years five specifically yeah absolutely and i think too um i think kind of what you were speaking to is like people who are not necessarily like quote-unquote gamers who are not big in the pc gaming world who aren't even console gaming like when i tell them oh we have the game and you can put it on your phone they're really excited because that's that's accessible true to them yeah because they're like oh well i i don't see myself as a gamer but yeah i'm not going to drop 400 bucks on a ps4 right yeah, absolutely right. so they they are able to actually put your game on their phone. And like, I think that's where mobile gaming has come in. Um, 
like there's a lot of the casual gaming like you know candy crush and those type of things but i think you are seeing more and more like smaller versions of games you would normally see on pc or console because people are realizing that it's a really accessible format for people who might not consider themselves gamers to play games yeah and when you can actually cross you know cross publish a game from pc to mobile um and especially if it's a unique game that can really excite people who aren't well versed in games and don't really care for the the typical game experience. Something like her story, you can download, pay like five bucks for, I think, and have one of the most unique interactive experiences that you'll ever have. Yeah. Um, this is a this is a full motion video game, hmm. the resurgence of full motion video in games, um, where you're just you're trying to learn about a story that happened. Um, in the context of police videos. And it's really, really cool. And you have a lot of agency over that, like how you how you search for what videos pop up and things like that. And that's something that is is so accessible both on PC and on mobile that it's been um, it's been really popular for people who don't typically consider themselves gamers because it's it's almost more like a film. Um in that it's you know it's just you're you're learning a really interesting story and it's being told to you in one of the most unique ways that you could imagine um, and that's what's really exciting is like how accessible mobile makes games like that specifically hmm. yeah, absolutely. so of that uh, you just mentioned 4.99 or five dollars to download that one mm -hmm. of the games that are released by these indie companies and let's say there's a two dollar price tag to download it on your iphone how much of that is profit and how much of that goes to overhead is there is there a way to make i mean do you have to like really turn up the price like a five dollar game obviously you're gonna make more money but is it are we seeing a huge difference in how much you make based on the dollar two you might more you might charge for the game it's fairly standard um 70 30 split like publishers take 30 percent like ios or google and I'm yeah wrong about that. i'm not um, sure if we're contractually obligated to keep that anonymous or uh, to keep that um, oh no, that okay. That's public, like for mobile, <laughs> okay. that's public knowledge. Yeah. Um, for, when you do do something for console, like that is proprietary, and you don't okay. talk about it, right? Um, but they, uh, yeah, but that's not an uncommon, yeah, that's not kind of ratio. Conflict, but it really depends on each studio, like your overhead. Like if you work out of your house, like for ours, like we because we are a small studio and we're just getting started, like our overhead, we keep our overhead as small as possible. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um. And we will stay that way for probably a really long time. But then you other have other people who go like full in and they get office space and they um, are paying themselves like salaries. And that it just makes it a very different game of what, what you have to make. Mm -hmm. And also mobile is a very different thing because most people don't pay for mobile games. Like mm -hmm. the free to play is really the standard. Um, and so there there is a small contingent of people who are like, I am definitely that, the type of person that prefers just to pay for a game up front and be mm -hmm. done with it. But I'm pretty sure I'm in the minority on that. Um, most people prefer a free game and then you get like monetized like every step you turn and it, I don't know. If you yeah. want to buy power credits, then you have to like pay, put in your iTunes or whatever it is, the Google yes. account. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And even still, I mean like you're paying, you're paying your time if it's with ads and things like that. So you have to, you have to kind of weigh that. But as a, as a creator, as a game developer, um, there are platforms that you can release to where you get a larger cut. Um, platforms like itch.io is a, a web platform where you can release uh, any any platform game, actually. You can let people download um, Android games, I think, even, and uh, PC, Mac, Linux, Steam, things like that. Um, and you get, you get a substantial cut from that, but it's harder to promote those because they're less popular platforms. Hmm. Um, and then you can also obviously release on your own website or something and, you know, try to try to make 100 percent. But that's so hard to promote. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of people see, you know, this is a really popular game. You've sold X many of copies. So therefore you've made, you know, if you sell a five dollar game and you've sold five thousand, that means you've made twenty five thousand dollars. It's like, no, that's not how it works. Right. You know, like we're we're paying the publisher or we're paying the platform to put our stuff up there. Um, and so it, it is important to remember that, you know, we're, <laughs> we're just trying to survive if we're trying to charge, you know, a dollar or three dollars or five dollars. Well, and also premium games, I actually wasn't aware of this until recently, like piracy is a really big Huge. Issue. Yeah, like, it, and honestly, someone who's like, oh, five dollars for a game, that sounds great. Like, it mm -hmm. never occurred to me to try to pirate it, um, probably because I'm lazy. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so even if, like, you have a certain number of, like, downloads or users, that doesn't necessarily mean those are all paying users mm -hmm. for your game. 
Yeah. We have friends, uh, Butterscotch Shenanigans, who have done kind of report reporting and um, tracking and researching on how many pirates they've had. And it's really, really fascinating that it's yeah. just an overwhelming quantity of pirates, especially on open platforms like Android and PC, where it's a lot easier to, you know, rip off the game and, you know, <laughs> and distribute it for free through, you know, these kind of back end channels. Um, and I think a lot of people just, you know, they don't realize that every indie studio isn't a massive behemoth like, you know, EA or something, and that we rely on those sales to survive. Well, and even in the indie world, like, you, there's, like, ranks, like, you have, like, almost low, how do, what are they, like, lowercase? Yeah, lowercase like, AAA or double A. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, um, so you do have companies that have, that have, cat like, have bankroll um, that are a little bit bigger, but they're still considered indie, and then you have companies like ours that are, you know, very grassroots and, like, small mm-hmm. um eensy weensy yes, very, 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 <laughs> um and so there's even that difference there so people like yeah there's definitely they're like oh whatever they're a big company it does, it's not really hurting them right and you know one download no but thousands of downloads absolutely mm-hmm. so. one of the games i play on here is the injustice gods among us version mm-hmm. where it's the dc mm-hmm. and they'll release like a brand new character and you have to power them up and everything and it takes like a month and a half and then i see people i like, go into a battle and this guy's already got a maxed out person with you know, downloadable weapons that I've not even seen before. Is that really terribly common also in the indie game world as well? Um, it or- kind of depends on the developer. Um, so you're talking, those were in-app purchases that somebody was able to... Yeah, you've actually yeah, got to either, them. you've either got to win the, the hero from a quest or you can purchase them outright and right. you can, you know, I, I guess they just go in and hack it, I suppose, and just, but it, it happens so commonly where a lot of people like me who play by the rules are like, ugh, so is there, you would think a big, again, a big corporation would have things in place to keep that from happening, but is it just kind of overlooked or is it not? Well, if they're in-game purchases, they want that to happen because that's how they make their money. <laughs> um, well, I'm saying like the, oh. the, the hour after it's released, this guy's already got a leveled up where you actually have to fight to level up your guy. Oh, yeah. So gotcha. stuff like that. People oh. who try hacking. to game the system are going to happen in any any yes, game. Yeah, um, you can really my, totally shut that down. Yeah, our friend um, TJ Hughes of Terrifying Jellyfish just released his first game on Steam and within you know, maybe an hour, um, there was like some max leaderboard score that was just completely unrealistic. And he's like, yep, somebody (laughs) hacked it already. (laughs) It's just people want to see how they can break the system. Mm. And there are ways that you can um, prevent that from happening. Um, But it's just, it's kind of silly to, (laughs) I mean, in some cases, I guess in, in your case, that kind of breaks the game for the players who are playing by the rules. Um, but in the cases where it's just, you know, breaking the leaderboards, usually you can wipe that out and try to find where they're, you know, where they're breaking in and then lock it down as best as you can. I got to say, I'm liking indie games more just from the names. Happy Badger, Terrifying Jellyfish. These are, uh, these are fun <laughs> names. <laughs> it, it is, yeah, Butterscotch fun. Shenanigans. So let me let me ask you about that Volcano too. Uh, respectively, where do you each come up for your uh, names? Mary, where did you get Volcano Bean from? Um, that actually came from um, my husband and I, our oldest daughter, when she was very tiny and like six weeks old she would get this face when she was you know as tiny babies are angry a lot because they can't communicate she'd get this face and we call it volcano face because it was just bright red and angry um and we when we were forming our company uh, several years ago because we kind of had a different um angle at first we were thinking of something that was you know not really nonsensical but something that mattered to us but was also just kind of funny and volcano face didn't quite feel right but we also called her bean she was very long and skinny, like a string bean. <laughs> so we decided to like mash the two together and call it volcano bean, just because it was kind of nice. fun. Yeah, it's adorable. Yeah, like important to us, or not important, but like meaningful to us, but also kind of yeah, nonsensical and like it's our business. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And is it her? Whenever you have your splash screen on your games, is that her voice saying volcano bean? That's actually, I'm pretty sure volcano bean is our partner Matt's son Mason, and then um, we had a company that did illustration or. Part of our company was we did illustrations called Unicorgy, oh, um, and that's my daughter is the one that says Unicorgy. Okay, maybe maybe that's what I'm. Yeah, thinking. so there are two. It is our children. Um, Unicorgy. Yes. <laughs> that's a corgi dog with a horn out of its head, I guess. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Just as fun and ridiculous as you would think. Nice. Um, so we did a lot of um like fun pop culture illustrations, which is where we made a coloring book um called My First Dungeon Adventure, hmm. and that's actually I was like this would make a really fun game for our kids to play. But that would have been a really big, kind of obnoxiously large project, mm. the first project. And so I was like, any dungeon game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
So we decided to like scale it down. Um, and again, that's where I'm like, let's just make something really small and see what the process is. And again, so even now when I say that, I laugh at my former self, like how even a very, very small, like some quote unquote simple game was just a much bigger process. And thankfully we fell in love with the process, mm. but yeah. it really, it's, it was, I, I don't know, I'm very much a person of like, let's do this. We'll figure it out on the way. <laughs> and we have, um, but yeah, so that's kind of where it started. It was just like, oh, well, let's try this and see if we like it. And then it turned into something like much bigger and something we're really excited about. That's actually how I assemble furniture. I just throw the instructions, let's figure it out as we go. And it never turns out right. Just, so you're a, lucky. That's not <laughs> a good idea. No. <laughs> Again, that's why I joke about the wibbly wobbly. Like you definitely kind of like have to make You figure course, it out. Yeah, you have to make course adjustments along the way. Um, but yeah, you figure it out and kind of find the path that you need to go. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of people mentioning because I, you know, between running the studio and you know, hosting all these events and co-organizing Pixel Pop Festival, which is a game festival in St. Louis. Mm. Um, and like also just like whatever side projects I decide to pick up. I've had a lot of people saying, wow, you do so many things. That's so cool. I'm like, I do it because I have to <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know what I want to spend most of my time doing because like I want to do everything. And it's it's really hard to like to, you know, hone in on one specific Absolutely. thing when you're still trying to explore what it is that matters most to you well, I think that's what we found games were like because all three of us were artists like went to school for art and marketing and um like we realized like gaming really was all the little different pieces that we had spent time developing over the years like as teenagers and as college students and in our professional lives and we're like oh wait and we've all were gamers our whole lives um or play games our whole lives so we're like oh this is industry literally combined all of our interests <laughs> so you get to like jump around and like hmm. wear, a, wear a bunch of different hats yeah makes it really fun um, to do. So, Carol, same question. Happy Badger? Oh, um, I have a much less interesting story for that. <laughs> so that's part, part of why I was trying to... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> no, Would you rather it's abstain just, from the question no, that is it's allowed? Fine. Okay, it's okay. fine. It's just like, so Happy Badger Studio actually started out as a, a much larger group of friends who we all, like, this was way before we knew that there was a game development community in St. Louis, and we all just kind of knew that we wanted to be making games, and we didn't know how, and so we were like, all right, let's team up. Um, I already had my studio rampant creative group with my two partners, and we were doing graphic design and uh, web design and all this stuff. And we decided to partner with a group of friends who were working for a different studio, but weren't getting the resources they needed to make games. And we're like, we'll provide the resources you need. You form the studio and then we'll partner up and be awesome together. And um, so they did that and um, they formed the studio and it took us forever to try to come up with like what the name was going to be. And just like one night when we were having a, you know, like an all team meeting, one of the guys was like, what about something stupid like Happy Badger Studio? We're like, all right, sold. <laughs> <laughs> so like there's no real background to it other than just like one of the team members, one of the original team members was like, what about this silly thing? And we're all like, all right, ship it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, those folks, um, all we, we made a game together. It was called Stodgy Gents. It won an RFT award nice. for, you know, best best app of St. Louis for the year that it came out. Um, and everybody on the team just kind of decided that they weren't interested in um, pursuing that as much as they were interested in pursuing other interests. Um, and so they all kind of went their own different ways. And we wound up acquiring the studio under the Rampant Creative Group uh, umbrella. And so that's how I became a part of Happy Badger Studio. Nice. And that is a lot more than answering how we came up with the name, <laughs> but it's it's that's it fine. Yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. weird it's a weird path to how <laughs> it's part of the journey. That's fine. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> it's that wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, <laughs> gamey devy. Another question: I know some people who do a certain thing for a living don't like it when they're not. So, <laughs> has this soured you on playing games? I guess <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. Um, no, I think really just becoming a parent so my children are almost five and seven um and so you just have a lot less time so I have to be much more selective about where I spend my time and I think that's actually what has drawn me to mobile games um and wanted to develop games in general is just I always have usually always have my phone on me or it's just it's a lot easier for me to pick up an iPad or pick up my phone mm -hmm. and play a game for yeah. 20 minutes than I don't get to sit down for three hours and play I got Fable, I'm pretty sure I played from, like, start to finish, like, in one sitting oh, yeah. when it came out, like, back in the early 2000s. Like, um, I, that is not a possibility in my life anymore. Um, so, yeah, like, I don't think it soured me at all. Like, I don't know. I think mm -mm. it actually makes it more fun because mm -hmm. you get to see how other people 
the choices that they made and now having done development you see those choices with a very different eye and there's a lot I more nuance really, to so many games now yeah. yeah and i find it really fascinating and really interesting and maybe some other people might not maybe that like would break their experience mm-hmm. you're almost breaking apart a game every time you're playing it but it's like being a filmmaker and yes. then suddenly every time you watch a film you're like cut cut yes. yeah. <laughs> you, see, you see the editing like, yeah you see behind the curtain you kind of yeah. can't unsee right action. sure yeah um but I, I find that that actually makes it better for mm-hmm. me. But I just think that's how I, my brain works. I totally agree. Like making, I mean, I've always played games, but since I've started making games, and especially since I've started getting connected with, you know, the game development community on an international level, I'm now open. Up, I opened up to so many more games than I ever would have known existed. And like, I get so excited about playing games because I find so much inspiration from other people's work that I, I make so much more time for myself to play games now. And I know a lot of game developers who they're like, I don't have time to play. I just make my games. And I think that that's a huge mistake because there's so much you can learn from other people's work and so much that you can gain from other people's creativity that um, I just like whenever I can, I try to play something. And I, I usually try to play something that is not, you know, a mainstream popular title because I find a lot of inspiration in these kind of weird fringe titles that you know, they do something totally different, like I said, like Her Story. Or um, there was a game that recently came out called Firewatch, which is this beautiful narrative game that's like, it's sort of like um, people have compared it to like Twin Peaks <laughs> in game really? form. Yeah. Huh. yeah. A lot of people have said that they would prefer it had been a movie just because they wanted to just be immersed in the story. Mm-mm. And then some people I know you really loved playing it. I get so excited about being the character and being in that world and being a part of it. Yeah, but it's just really great that those like there are more experiences like that in games and it's not just I don't know games that you would normally think of yeah and like even when because when you were saying um when you make games or when you make something for work do you want to go home and keep doing that is I thought you were going to say do you even make games on your own when you're you know by yourself and yeah I was going to say yes absolutely <laughs> like I that I, I express myself through interactivity hmm. and so even when I'm not making you know the big game I'm coming up with ideas for smaller games. And even, you know, one of my side projects um, is a card game that I'm about to publish. Oh, cool. (laughs) Like the the giant shipment of manufactured, 1,500 copies of this manufactured game are sitting in a warehouse in St. Louis ready to ship to my studio. And that was just because I came up with an idea and I was like, at work, you know, we're working on client projects, we're working on our bigger game. And I was just like, it would be really fun if I made a game about mocking corporate culture. And I did. And I, you know, put it on Kickstarter because I wouldn't have had any other way to fund it. Hmm. And I got, you know, $11,000 to wow, make this game. that's impressive. And it's been a phenomenal experience. And it, it's reminded me that, you know, coming up with these things on your own and working on side projects is hugely important. Absolutely. Because it's just like doing little like prototyping mechanics. Or yeah. Just doing little things that like spark your interest. Like the other day I should have been working on our main game and instead I just had like the side game that would not get out of my head. Oh, it's so important. Like just writing out notes and like writing out mechanics and doing little tests just to like almost get it on paper and then I, you know, put it to the side and I'll work on it later. But yeah, it's kind of like finding that line of following when inspiration strikes you and then also having to just put your nose to the grindstone and get Hmm. your work done. There was like an entire month where I spent every Sunday working on a different gameplay mechanic prototype, just like (laughs) <laughs> yeah, know, there's something that was so great, like just making something really small and it not being necessarily a polished, finished thing. There's something really yeah. productive in that and really great in that. And you might not use it for anything in particular, but just creating it is a lesson mm-hmm. to use in the next thing you're doing. And also, I guess it's one of those things where if you're focused on one game, it's kind of nice to take yeah. your mind off it and look yeah. at a different aspect of a different project. So I guess that's helpful as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think when you do a game like the actual project, even if it if it takes anywhere from two days to you know two years, like you're gonna hit a point like the beginning is really exciting, and you're gonna hit a point where it's just kind of a slog to get through. The exciting part is done. Like it's been designed. Yeah. Like you're just doing the work, mm-hmm. and you kind of need little breaks to get yourself excited about making games again, so you can go back to like just getting through the work. Yeah, game development's hard. <laughs> I know there was a, I can't remember if it's a director or an actor who said that when they start a project, they kind of do, and it's not untypical to steal ideas from other movies and other things and other actors' things. 
is that is there more of a struggle, especially in the indie games, to keep everything very original, or is that pretty much uh, you know I like this aspect of this game. We're going to incorporate some kind of aspect of that. Well, I think with games too, because mechanics you can't you're not very yeah. very rarely are you creating a new mechanic. I know that there are some studios that are going to do that because um, they're brilliant like that. But in general, like most mechanics have already been created, and you're creating your own and putting your own spin on it. Mm-hmm. So that's what makes it unique. I mean, most games fall within a genre. Um, and if you're not falling within a genre, you're taking a huge, huge risk. Yeah. Um, and so to answer your question, I mean, it is probably similar to film in that, you know, those indie filmmakers who are making like completely subversive films mm-hmm. that don't necessarily fall within any expected genre are potentially, you know, breaking down boundaries for other filmmakers and setting new standards for new filmmakers but they're also probably not going to make very much money and they're going to struggle to get their film noticed. Right. Um, they might win a lot of awards. Um, and you see that a lot in indie games um, where, you know, popular games are going to be ones that pull um, inspiration from existing mechanics and existing uh, games. And that's awesome because a lot of times when you do that, you find, or at least when you do that, you should find a way to improve upon that existing mechanic. Um, and so, you know, it's like, saying, I'm going to make a horror film, but I'm going to make a horror film that makes you feel a new way, um, which I don't really know. I'm not a filmmaker, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> just pulling that out of my right. butt. Um, but, you know, like, so, or like, I'm going to make an adventure game, but I'm going to make an adventure game with this new kind of um, relationship building mechanic instead of a combat mechanic um, and like see how that goes. And that a lot of times you'll find uh, more success with. If it's based on something that people are already familiar with, they already identify with, they already know what to expect, they're going to be more likely to embrace it than if it's something completely out of the box. But, I mean, there's the art game community and the alt game community where it's exclusively about coming up with completely new ways to create experiences for people. Um, which I really admire, and I've I've explored a little bit on my own, but it is not profitable. I mean, mm. like, no, and, and, and yeah, <laughs> it's hard like, to get attention for it. Yeah, and I think that's a conversation to have because um, coming from like the small theater world, um, like I'm used to artistic pursuits not being profitable, and you having to fundraise for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think with games, there's such like a stigma of like it has to be profitable, and it, but if that's not your goal, that's like mm-hmm. if you you know if you're fine spending the money or you're fine putting in the sweat equity to make a game and you don't care if it makes money awesome so like that's where the alt stuff comes in but people like there's that conversation of like why does it have to be profitable to be a great experience like or <laughs> for it to be made like yeah. but and really that comes down to your expectations as a company um or just as a person as a creator like, yeah as a creator because yeah not everyone is a company um so so both of you obviously would like to make money doing, and that's that's the goal, <laughs> I would think, except for the people who you spoke of. Yeah. Is there, when you start out to make a game, in the back of your mind, how much of that is, okay, we're going to have to do something that's going to make some money, but we also, I mean, how, how much of that factors into what type of game you decide to create? Um, I think for us, we knew going in that it was going to take a while, so we, I mean, I had a very long-range plan in knowing that our first two games were not going to be profitable for us as a studio, but were in and of themselves, very important stepping stones to hopefully our next game, which is our first game that we are actually going to monetize mm-hmm. um, in a traditional <laughs> sense. Right. Um, I mean, our games have ads on to them. To use dirty that, words yes. on the talk show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, our first games are ad-supported, which, again, we're, unless you have zillions of people in your game, you're not going to be just being ad-supported. And we try to make it like non-intrusive because we don't really want to break the experience. Um, mm-hmm. We're really just trying to cover like server costs and... Um, that kind of stuff. So I think it really just depends on your expectations as a studio or as a creator and where you want to go. So for us, like we entered it with a pretty long range, like it's going to take us several years um, and that's fine. We are able to do that. So. Yeah. Um, when it comes to making money, it's um, the, the thought and effort is less so much the game, like the game you have to care about and want to make and, put a lot of effort and um, passion into it. Mm -hmm. But what really, um, what making money really relies on is like we were talking about earlier, the promotion of the game. Sure. Yeah. Um, That's, you can make, you know, a kind of, you know, derivative kind of typical game 
and promote the hell out of it and be amazing at promotion. And a lot of people are going to play it and a lot of people are going to see it. Um, they may not love it. It may not be, you know, game of the year. But if you promote it really well, mm-hmm. you'll get players and you'll you'll make your money back most likely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's but it's really, really hard to promote well, especially in the space because there are so many people in it. So I say that, you know, loosely, there's no recipe to promote well. Um, yes, there's like a vague list of shoulds, but right. there's also luck and timing are also involved and in- I guess a lot of it would depend on what type of game you create too how easy or hard it is to promote I would think yeah, yeah yeah absolutely um and you know this is to be perfectly honest I've not made a super success like financially successful game yet um it's really hard and I'm still learning and I think that's something to be aware of as an indie you know getting started it takes a lot of you know experimenting and a lot of trial and error to figure out what works and what doesn't. Well, and if you pay attention, a lot of companies will talk about it pretty openly, like yeah. that probably, you know, even companies that have like 15 games, they'll be pretty honest that only two of those games are successful, mm-hmm. financially successful, and then those two games carry the other 13. Absolutely. Um, and that's a fairly common experience, so it's kind of a numbers game of you, you, you kind of can't, I mean, depending on your goals, like if you want to be making money, like it's, you have to be getting games out in a timely manner just because you never know when your next one is going to hit or how long, like even if you have a really successful game, what that shelf life is going to be. It might not be, it could only be for three months or it could be for five years, but you, you're not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot like anything else. Songwriting for, you know, you might have a hit song. You might not, you know, movies, you might have a, you know, Johnny Depp might have his Malachi or you might have a Pirates of the Caribbean. So you don't know what's going to, yeah, it's entertainment media. I mean, it's it depends on the player base, the viewer base, the you know the fan base in general. Um, and and building a community around your work is the best thing that you can do. Mm-hmm. Like getting your little community of people that are excited about your game, so every mm-hmm. time you put something out, they want to buy it. Like at least that's our goal as a yeah. company. It's not so much to like take the world indie games world by storm. It's just to build a community that's excited about the things we want to make. Yeah, and I um, think I think that's there. across the board for entertainment media yeah. in general. So I think, I mean, it's that applies in so many different places. Well, and it's especially, I feel like games is such a shifting market right now. Mm-hmm. Like just in the last five years, like even, you know, 10 years ago, like this wouldn't even have been on my radar as something we could have done. Yeah. Even like five years ago, like, I don't know. It's just how, what a big shift in such a short amount of time and it's still shifting. And so it's kind of like, you're going to get the people that figure out like the next new path and they're going to be the like, groundbreakers who are really successful and mm-hmm. then people kind of start following that path and then someone finds a new one and vr <laughs> yes exactly like it's when um the iphone came out like mm-hmm. yeah. mobile games in general like they're really not that old like i was joking with someone right yeah they the iphone came out right before my oldest daughter was born i'm like they're not that i have a human <laughs> that i can like see like this is how old she is like, yeah that's how old you know game mobile games are only a little bit older than her right like, She's in first grade. But the first people to put games on iPhone were extraordinarily successful Absolutely. because they were much fewer. And now right. there's yeah. less competition. Yeah. Absolutely. There's millions of games on the store. Like like Mary said, there's thousands coming out every week. So it's really hard to find, you know, to get your to get your way up to the top of the charts. Yeah. So again, in terms of comic books, because that's kind of what I know. Sure. Mm-hmm. The 30s and the 40s were the golden age because there's all these new things popping up that were brand new. We had Superman, Batman. Would you say because of the fact that now there are so many competitions, are we past the golden age of indie gaming or would you say we're still kind of in that meaty period? It's interesting you ask this because this is kind of a hot topic of conversation in the game industry right now. There's the term being thrown around indie apocalypse. Oh. That the waters are getting mucky because there's so many game devs, you know, fighting for fighting for money. Um that you know everybody's freaking out are indie games no longer viable and the the truth is as long as you're making good games and you're promoting them well they're viable Mm. to an extent um yeah the money's getting spread out through you know over a lot more games and it's a lot harder to make a good game that gets seen but that doesn't mean that it's not possible but yeah i mean the golden age i think was i mean the golden age is always going to be when there's a new platform mm-hmm. that you can break into. And that's why I think a lot of people, I mentioned VR earlier as a joke, but a lot of people are moving toward VR um, because it's the next new thing. And so it's kind of like that gold rush of, oh, maybe this will be the opportunity for me mm-hmm. to get noticed or for my for me to make a game that actually gets, you know, yeah. <laughs> recognized. Absolutely. Okay. And so just as we wrap up, um, what would you say for someone who wants to get into it? Someone who's 
hey, I've, I've got ideas and I'd like to start jumping into this field. What would be the best, not necessarily easiest way, but I guess what's, <laughs> what's the best way for someone like that who wants, I mean, should they should they go to school for it? Is that a good thing to do? Should they start networking? What, <laughs> Mary, how you? like, I was gonna say, we can <laughs> see the face, face yeah. Like, yeah. No. Um, no, I think really the, and I know this has come up a lot, but like just start making them. There's so much, so much free software. Um, I mean, assuming you have a computer, but like there's so many, and you, but you could even do card games or board games or just start making prototypes, start making games mm-hmm. and figure out where you want to go. Like, I don't think you have to have this big, huge plan of like, I'm going to build, it's kind of good to have a, a long-term plan, but like if you're just starting, just make games and make sure you like making games. Yeah, make and fail and learn and make yeah. and fail and learn and Iterate. make and fail and learn and make and maybe win and learn yeah. <laughs> and then make again. Yes. It's just, I mean, the best thing, I mean, like Mary said, there's so many resources out there. There's so many free tools. There's so much available to you. Even if you don't program or make art, there's narrative tools out there called Twine, Inkle Writer, things like this that just allow you to start making interactive projects for like for nothing Hmm. absolutely nothing and then there's the platforms like itch.io like i said earlier it's free to publish to itch and i have you know i have free games up on there just so that people can play them um and it's just it's it's so easy to start that there's no reason to not if you want to start making games um another thing is if you're local to st louis or if you're local to anywhere with a game community in your city go and meet other people who are working on the same kinds of projects or different kinds of projects and allow yourself to learn from them, allow yourself to be inspired by them and just like make connections so that you have more people who can help you achieve your dreams and who you can help achieve theirs. It's absolutely what I was going to say. When we made our first game, we didn't actually know that there was a community in hmm. St. Louis. We happened to find it like toward the end of our process. And I, I really cannot put into words how helpful like going to those meetups and going to those events like really were in us pushing us forward because we might have been like oh like after our first game like I think we might have just stalled out if we hadn't met other people who are also making games yeah. and got involved in the community like it's it so motivating different. so the networking is good it's not like because uh, I know some of some businesses are kind of cutthroat and oh I don't want to give them ideas away so oh, gotcha. there's a lot it's not that way then yeah. it's very networking and relying well, on even if I literally sat someone down and said this is exactly how we made our games like they're not going to be able to recreate it in the same way and they're going to have their spin on it and it's going to be different and they're not going to have our art style and i don't know like i guess no it's not a worry then i'm never worried about that i know like even being in the fine arts i know there were some people who were very like protective of their techniques Mm -hmm. and such but i don't know i've never been i've always been a very the tide rises like yeah exactly yeah and like put give your knowledge like if you know something share it with everyone else and that just makes everyone better yeah, I've I've discovered um, through my many years, my my many years, my four or five <laughs> years in the industry, um, that the game space is uniquely uncompetitive. Yeah. Um, in that, like the distribution platforms, unless you're releasing on the same day and you have the same kind of game as someone, which is unlikely but possible, you're not going to be competing with them. And even if you do that, there's it's so unlikely that there's going to be bad blood. Um, game creators typically aren't interested in stealing ideas because most of us have our own ideas. Sure. That we yeah, okay. Work yeah. With. It makes More sense. Ideas than um, <laughs> with, generally. And like we get people coming up and pitching us game ideas all the time. Like, Hey, you should make this. And it's like, no, I want to make my own stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like I've got so many ideas. Like I'm not even going to think about somebody else's right now. You should yeah. make this, sir. Yeah. So, <laughs> and like, I, I've just found again, internationally, like I go to a lot of events throughout the country and everybody is supportive of each other and everybody wants to help each other and everybody is just so nice and encouraging and welcoming and you're going to find those few fringe cases where you know somebody's like oh i can't let you know about my idea but that is definitely you know a rarity in the industry which is really cool yeah absolutely coming from other industries uh, my husband and i like we did pixel pop this mm-hmm. last year and we like after that weekend we were just like this community is amazing like it mm-hmm. was so like so welcoming and so open and everyone was just so ex- everyone was so excited about what they were doing i don't know it's just so encouraging and it, it, that's definitely not the case in a lot of other other industries where people are like this is my tiny corner that i have carved out and i don't want to give it to anyone mm-hmm. else right. i'm going to share that with you um yeah so it was really nice surprise to like come to the yeah. game development world and find that it was so great it's beautiful like if, if you go to pixel pop which is um it's it's going to be in its third year this year uh october 8th and 9th at the st louis science center um, you'll see all of these game developers playing each other's games, giving each other feedback, you know, showing each other support. 
um, giving advice. You know, it's just like it's such a beautiful experience, and it's it's meant it's a festival meant for both players and developers. So like. It's an opportunity also for players to feel like they're a part of the game making process. Yeah, we actually got some really fantastic feedback on our second game, Sleepy Kraken, at Pixel Pop. And then when we took it to the Science Center, we did a lot of public play testing with that game. And like we had people that saw us at Pixel Pop and then they got to see like the, their things that they'd said to us like ended up in the game. And it was this nine year old girl that she was really excited. <laughs> yeah. And that was really exciting for me to like, she got to see like her, because her father was with her at Pixel Pop, like kind of like, encourage her to give us actual feedback not just like oh i like your game but like mm -hmm. what about it do you like what about it constructive oh, yes constructive criticism and um i don't know just seeing her be excited that her words mattered to us like was really fantastic and because there's not that rabidly competitive streak you didn't have litigation engaged against you by nine-year-olds <laughs> that's also a plus that's exactly. good exactly um but yeah because it made it a better game experience not only for her but for everybody else who played it and if people want to go to that, the website, I assume, is just pixelpop.com? Pixelpopfestival.com, yeah. Pistol pop, pixelpopfestival.com. Yeah. And uh, why don't we uh, give a little information about yours, uh, Volcano Bean? How would they reach you, contact you? Um, you can, we're at volcanobean.com. We're also at Volcano Bean on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and yeah, I think those are all our major channels. Okay. Carol? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, my personal Twitter is at Carol Mertz. Uh, Happy Badgers or happybadgers.com and at Happy Badgers on Twitter. Um, yeah, and then Pixel Pop, uh, pixelpopfestival.com, and I think it's at Pixel Pop Fest on Twitter. And then the St. Louis Game Developer Co-op. Oh my gosh. Yes, I yes, so president things. of that. Yeah, I can't um, let that out. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved in the co-op, uh, the website is stlgamedev.com, and that has a list of all of the upcoming industry events, has a list of the existing studios, um, who are members of the co-op, and just has also a list of resources on how to help you get started. Um, and then there's a Facebook group called St. Louis Game Developers and a meetup group called St. Louis Game Dev. So um, check us out, come to an event, say hey, uh, and learn some things. If anyone who's not my direct friend is still listening to this, and I find that hard to believe, <laughs> if you're outside the St. Louis area, what's a good website? Uh, is there a good one to, for other people in other regions to meet up if they want to have similar, like if they don't have an STL game I would developer club? Google game development in your city. Yeah, um, that's actually how I found our local community was okay. googling independent game developers in yeah. st louis in the name of your city there's yeah there's a lot of different professional organizations like the international game developers association yes. is one of them um there's the game dev drink up which happens in several cities worldwide yeah. and there's uh, game jams all over the country all over oh yeah the world. Um, and they all happen there's one that happens the same weekend everywhere right? the global game Neat. jam wow. yeah is the last it's like there's like Tens of thousands of people jam at the same time. We had the fifth largest in the in the country. That's crazy. In yeah, St. Louis. Louis has like a really surprisingly large game development scene, like for its size, like what? like St. Louis. Size. Yeah, like, St. Louis is St. Louis is a big small city. It is. Right. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, but yeah, the the global game jam is um, it's always the last weekend of January, and it is phenomenal to be able to make games with you know thousands of other people throughout the throughout the world. So I would definitely look into that if you're interested in jams. But in the meantime, just start, get started <laughs> on your own. And you listen to a lot of free software for people to do just that if they want to. So that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, very. thank you again. Uh, thank you, Mary. Yes. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate your coming in on a Saturday morning. <laughs> and I'll uh, email you this link as soon as it's up. Thank, awesome. you. thank you. And thank you for all you who listen. Uh, keep on geeking out.